So it is technically the 10th of Av, but we are observing the fast day for Tisha B'Av, and uh, it's a long one. It's a little more difficult than um, Yom Kippur, because Yom Kippur, you know that a lot more people are fasting. Uh, Tisha B'Av, I've usually been able to count on one hand the number of people I know who are fasting. But I know people who partially fast, and it, it is, um, it's, it's an odd day. And one thing Jewish people, um, I've, I've said this to other people before, Jewish people, we do really well, is mourning. Um, we, we do death well, we do mourning pretty well. Uh, we have rituals that help us to deal. And... Um, it's kind of, you know, one of the differences between us and maybe other faiths. Like some faiths, when something bad happens, people chalk it up to good. And, or they, they might try to find a positive outlook. And in Judaism, we're pretty comfortable with dealing with tragedy. You do have to move on, but uh, mourning is an important part of, of dealing with loss. And the fact that we still mourn the temples 2,000 years later, the fact that we still remember the, uh, the tragic things that have befallen our people throughout history, you know, we, we keep up with this and um, we're reminded it's these, and really that's what a lot of Judaism is. Uh, they're, they're reminders to stop and remember certain things as you go about your daily life. Um, when you, um, it, when you, if you're a religious Jewish uh, person who wraps tefillin on your arm and on your forehead in the uh, in the mornings, uh, you are remembering the commandments of God. Uh, Jews who wear the uh, the ritual fringes um, either all the time or just for prayer services uh, they might have a prayer shawl on. Or very religious Jews will wear an undergarment with the fringes either tucked in or hanging out. Uh, from Numbers 15 to remind themselves of the commandments of God. Uh, we have a, a mezuzah on our doorpost. I'm looking at mine right now. And they remind us of the commandments of God from the book of Deuteronomy, where he says to write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. That word for doorpost is a mezuzah. And so we have, uh, we have little boxes with... Um, that scripture in them so we can be reminded of what our obligations are. We have, uh, we have holidays that remind us of certain things like Pe uh, Pesach or Passover reminds us of God's deliverance of our people from Egypt and the Exodus. Uh, the holiday of Hanukkah reminds us of when we were able to overcome uh, those who wish to to oppress us and tell us how to worship. We have Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, where we are told to remember by the sound of the shofar, the, uh, the ram's horn blast, that uh, we are going to be in judgment before God, which even if you want to make this more metaphorical, then the idea is that one day you are going to die and be judged according to your deeds. And you could even take that and say, judged in the eyes of God or judged in the eyes of mankind or humankind. And we we have a lot of these reminders. Shabbat reminds us that we are not in charge of the world, that we are obligated to work hard in this world, but for at least 25 hours we're able to stop and to remember that we are not in charge. So we have lots of reminders in Judaism. Uh, we are often told to remember certain things. Remember uh, the Sabbath day. Um, Remember that you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So we have a lot of these remembrances. And that's one thing Jews do well. And uh, we have these services called Yisker services. Yisker means he will remember. And so we, we remember the, uh, those who have uh, departed from this world on the anniversary of their death, but also at these special services throughout the year that usually correspond, in fact, they all correspond to major Jewish holidays. So, today is Tisha B'Av, an observance, even though it's technically the 10th of Av, the next day. 
And I was looking at the book of Echa last night, the book of Lamentations that we read. And the word Echa means how. How, how could this be? How could Jerusalem be desolate? How could the temple be destroyed? How could we be in this state? And also it's asking, how can we ever be restored? Is it possible for us to be restored? And there's this, there's this little thread of hope running throughout the book, but it's, it's covered by kind of a hugely pessimistic lament, which is why the English name that we know the text by is Lamentations. And it, it will, it's kind of like God is in charge and we deserve this for our sins. Perhaps he will help us. Perhaps he will restore us. Perhaps he will be merciful. Perhaps not. And it kind of just, it's this back and forth. And my family's been living in a state of echa for quite a while. Um, sometimes it's the emotional echa. How can this be? How can this be going on? How could a person who was a part of our life and we loved and was a part of our family hurt us this way? And how can people and how can people not want to know? And, and how can this be happening? And then there's more like my father's echa. A few weeks ago, my father was just sitting there at his house and uh, on the back porch and I was on the porch swing and he was in his chair and he was just staring off and he said, What's the point of all this? What was the point of all of this? All these years, everything that was happening, what, what was the point? And so it's like dramatic and it's slow. And then we have these moments of, of, of kind of, of smiling and joy and, and it's like, okay, things are gonna get better. And then back into kind of despair and, you know, it's interesting. One of my favorite parts of the Book of Lamentations uh, is at the end. My father and I were reading this some years ago. Had to have been some years ago because it was at the kitchen table in the house that was uh, destroyed in the tornado in 2019. And we were reading it aloud. And I was just shocked by how much of, um, of text uh, from the liturgy that we use in services, uh, the daily prayers, the prayers of the Torah service that are in this book. And the last, uh, the second to last verse, um, if you've ever been in a synagogue where the Torah is taken out and read, passed around, and then put back up, we sing this uh, phrase, Hashkivenu Adonai Elohaiq Nashuva Chadesh Yamenu Kekedem, which is Hashkivenu um, Bring us back, God, uh, to yourself, um, and uh, we will return, uh, renew our uh, days as in olden times. And it's interesting the word Kedem. Uh, it's kind of like these these ancient times in modern Hebrew that word is also used to denote progress so a Jewish understanding is that in order to move forward you have to go back because in Judaism the past was always the good time there was always this time where things were better and that's not every culture and every religious understanding uh, throughout the world that's kind of a Jewish way is that that there's this idea that we're already not good enough <laughs> We're already not quite where we should be. They had it all together. Which is funny when you, I mean, that's, it, there's this idea that Jews were always late to, the, to everything in the sense of we're always late to the good times. We're always late to um, when we were in a righteous state. And if you read the, the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, uh, what Christians call the Old Testament, we, we never really got there. But we always feel like at some point we were there and we're not anymore. And um, I've hoped a lot during this time that, uh, that God would, I don't know how, but that God would bring us back. You know, I don't, I don't hope that God will move us forward because I don't like what forward looks like. Forward doesn't look uh, good to me. I, I like there was a time when there was happiness. And I realize now that there was deceit going on and, and all this, but there was a time when there was happiness. And I, I would like to go back to that. 
I would do anything I could just about to go back to that. One thing that's really hurt is um, is knowing not how much we were lied to because a lie is saying one thing that is true when it's false or saying something is false when it's true. That's lying. But the whole cloth making up of stories, um, that's been really hurtful to all of us. And I know that I had a nervous breakdown last Rosh Hashanah. I was having a really hard time. I had forgotten about this, but apparently I had tried to um, to end my relationship with a person because I thought that they wanted to end it but didn't know how. And I didn't end it in like a negative, like an angry way. I just thought that they had decided that they... Um, that they didn't want the life they had with us, and I, I tried to end it, and uh, and um, the person said no, that all they wanted was our life together, and that they were coming back, and um, I'd been I got to a good place after a really rough time, and I held on to Rosh Hashanah until the Jewish New Year, which last year it's always in the fall. Last year was a little early; it was like early to mid September. And when they didn't come back, I I had a breakdown, and I, I haven't fully recovered from that yet. I um and they insisted they were still coming back, but I just held on for so long that even as they insisted they were coming back, it just it um it it's, it launched me into a big depression, and um, I quit saying my daily prayers, which I'd often say. But one thing that really has has hurt, and um, we've talked about this with my family, one of the lies that was completely unnecessary was that somebody very near and dear to this person who was very near and dear to us was hurt and sick. And this person would ask us to pray for them. My grandmother, my mom's mom would pray for them. My grandfather, who passed away a blessed memory he would pray for them my, my mom's family is is Christian and my grandmother she's the daughter of a Pentecostal minister one is Pentecostal minister so like she doesn't even pray like some Christians will say things like Heavenly Father Lord God something like that she doesn't she just says Jesus she goes straight to Jesus and she would pray for him my grandfather would always ask about him and they'd pray for him my rabbi I have live stream services from last summer where he's praying for them. He sent messages to my mother and myself apologizing that he could not get his doctor to release him to go into hospitals to visit people because he wanted to be there at the bedside of this person who he had never met, but it was the son of this woman that he loved. It was a part of our life that he made laugh and smile and he wanted to be there. And my dad, every morning, says his morning prayers, and he says the prayers for healing for those who are sick and ill. And for a year and a half, he has prayed for this boy, who's really, I guess, a man now. We kind of picture him as a boy because there was a time where they didn't have power um, when this person and I were in a romantic relationship but we weren't living together yet and I was still at my parents home they didn't have uh, power for a few days and so they came over to my parents house and did some laundry and so we still kind of imagine in our mind we and, and then also I went some places with him in his junior high year so we still kind of imagine like a, a kid kind of but he's he's in college now my father prayed for this boy said his name because that's one thing Jews do is we say the name of the person when we do the prayers and um, and this person who was near and dear to us would ask us to pray 
and even after I just I I lost an essence of my faith I didn't lose it completely but just what it had been she would ask me to pray she said I know you don't really think it makes that much of a difference but would you pray and if it was daytime I would uh, send her a picture when I was done I'd send her a picture of my arm without this my forearm I have tons of pictures of my forearm with the indentations of the tefillin because I would wrap tefillin and I would say I would do a service and I would say the prayer for healing and if it was night I would stop what I was doing and I would sit down and I'd grab a siddur I'd grab a prayer book and I would say the prayer for healing and on many Saturday mornings my family and I when I otherwise didn't feel like it would do a service together and we would sing the prayer for healing that sang in the synagogues from Debbie Friedman. He said the first verse, then we'd say the names of all those who were sick, and among those at different times was my mother with her cancer, my grandmother with her cancer, people part of our temple, people my father worked with, and this person who was a part of our family and her son. And we would say their name. And she would ask me, Did you say our name? Did you say his name? Did you say mine? Sometimes she would say, say, please make sure you say my name. And and we would sing the prayer. May the source of strength who blessed the ones before us help us find the courage to make our lives a blessing, and let us say, Amen. And we would say from our heart the names of those who were ill. Then we would sing the next verse. Mi shebera kimotenu, mekor habraka liavotenu. Bless those in need of healing with Rafua Shlema, the renewal of body, the renewal of spirit, and let us say Amen. So many prayers and so many times we were asked to pray. Some of the time the person asking us to pray was supposedly the person who was ill using the phone of this person who was a part of our family. Christians and Jews, my family and my community praying, hearts broken for what we were being told was happening and going on. And there was no need for that. We were told that the second temple, the one that was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD or CE, was destroyed because of baseless hatred. My mom was wondering if this person ever laughed at us for deceiving us like this. She would always say that when my mom got too old or got too ill that she would help me take care of her. I remember even before we lived together when we had been romantically involved for a while my mom had to have surgery and uh, we went and visited her in the hospital in, uh, in Lake Charles she had a hip replacement and I remember one time had to have been before December 2019 because uh, I was in the, my parents old house we went over there and uh, my dad was sitting in the living room. They had just gotten a TV that had Netflix on it. Every time you get something good, something bad happens. So then the tornado eventually happened, 
and he and I ended up he, we we're watching this movie it's one of my favorite movies um, uh, and I always forget the title it's a Cohen film a Cohen Brothers film it's about this guy and it's basically it's a story of Job set among a Jewish family in Minnesota in the late 1960s and uh, there's these funny things with these three rabbis and all this stuff and I showed my dad the film and we were going to just watch it and I, like, I was going to put it on and watch part of it with him and my mother and this other person sat at the dining room table and we ended up watching the entire film and they never came in the living room because they just were talking the whole time and and I think about they just had these long conversations together and you know to show it wasn't even just me and this person but that they had a bond with my family and that my family hurt for this person when they thought that they were in such pain. My mother messaged this person and said, is there anything we can do? And this person told my mother, within this year, said, would she be able to help take care? Would she be able to help take care of this sick person? if they came to live with us. And my mom said, of course. She would rearrange her day. She would come stay with us or they could go stay with them. And she would be there. It's those unnecessary things that just eat away at us. I cannot explain how much we love this person. And I cannot explain how much this person, and they knew this, that our relationship was part of the way that I for me, God was what I experienced when we were together. Last Tisha B'Av was one of the first in many years where I didn't uh, break the fast with uh, my favorite dish, which is called Lokshin Kugel. I have no idea how to make Lokshin Kugel. It's one of the few dishes I know I, I, this person made, and I had no idea how it was done. I knew there was a blender involved. I know there was cooking noodles and then adding the stuff. And I, I don't know. And she'd always say, don't, don't learn this recipe. She said, because if you learn it, she said, you're going to have no need for me. And she would say it half jokingly, but also half kind of true. And she'd say, you know, I know this is what you love. And she would often mispronounce it. She'd call it lotion kugel. Say lotion. And, uh, but I think even what was the point of that? You know, this idea of don't, don't learn this thing because this is, you know, otherwise you're not going to need me. And, and all that it was about was being needed And I have prayed this last prayer from the Torah service and from the Book of Lamentations quite a lot lately. Hashkivenu Adonai Elohaik Benashuva Chadesh Yamenu Kekedem. Bring us back, Lord, to yourself. We'll return. Renew us as in days of old. I don't know how that's possible, but... One thing that happens when there is a funeral, well, actually after a funeral, when uh, people are mourning, they sit shiva. 
Shiva just means they, they seven days they they sit and uh, it's um, people come to them and they visit and that same posture is what we do in Tisha B'Av. We usually we sit on the floor and we read the Book of Lamentations. We have our shoes off. And if you ever go to a Jewish house in the morning, you'll see the same thing. Mirrors will be covered. Um, people bring food. They don't eat, they don't provide food for people. People bring the food for them. And um, and you don't say anything. And it comes from the Book of Job, where um, his friends sit with him and they're they're silent at first. In fact, the problem in the Book of Job is when his friends quit being silent. And then when you leave, you take your leave of the family, you say, may you be comforted along with all those who mourn for Zion and Jerusalem. And the reason you give that, that um, I don't know what you would call it, salutation would be saying hello, that, that ending as you leave, that conclusion to your visit, is because one, you're acknowledging their suffering and their mourning. May you be comforted. But the along with all those who mourn for Zion and Jerusalem, it lets you know that you are not the only one who is suffering. And that Zion and Jerusalem, as they were when the temple stood, are no more. And the idea is everything will be right when we no longer are mourning for Zion in Jerusalem, when we have been renewed as in days of old. I'm not much of a believer in things, but I, for years now, my hope has been in what I had with this person, which was far from perfect, obviously, but even from what I knew was far from perfect, but it was... We used to say we weren't perfect, but we were us. That what we had, us, was worth more than... than anything else. Chadesh Yameinu Kekedim Renew us as in days of old. May we all be comforted along with all who mourn for Zion and for Jerusalem.